Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome. Um, this question, uh, not related to your names, so if your answer, it doesn't give me uh, your attendance, so please don't forget to sign in. And I will, I hope I will ask at least one more question today, which will be related to your names. So this is uh, anonymous, just pure statistics. Uh, by the way, just in case, if you haven't noticed, we have uh, regular office hours this week, and we also have office hours next week. Yes, so please use it. We don't have a regular review session, but we have so many office hours. So use it at your convenience <coughs> for any reason you may for to, to make up something what you want to make up. And uh, as you know, <coughs> you don't have to have each discussion grade or each lab grade, but uh, still, I would recommend to walk through the missing discussion or a missing lab just to get better set of connections you know, between the things we learn here, we talk about uh, in a lab, we use when we solve homework problems. All right. Well, I take 55 plus 24 plus 9 as a good sign, so 5 plus 8, that doesn't count. I call it a success. <clears throat> well, so we don't have much left to talk about physics-wise. There's one more, one more process I want to introduce you to, the adiabatic process, <coughs> adiabatic process. That's an official definition of the diabetic process happens when the system doesn't exchange heat with an, an, an environment. So we have two options when it might happen. Number one, an insulated or isolated system. And in that case, of course, the heat balance equation works, nothing new. But another important situation is when the process is happening so fast, so quickly, that the gas doesn't have time to communicate with the surroundings. And in this situation, in this situation, there is a relationship between the change in the eternal energy of this gas and the work done on the gas, or well, by the gas or on the gas. Yeah. If Q is zero, the change in the internal energy is equal to the work done by the gas times negative one, which is the work done on the gas. If we do positive work, we increase internal energy if we do it quickly. And uh, well, first of all, people use it very heavily. For example, when they use A diesel engine, you know, not internal combustion engine, but a diesel one. So what's happening in there? Well, first of all, you need a flammable, flammable uh, medium. Tiny piece of uh, cotton or paper. Now, so you need that material and a gas, the air, of course, to be insulated. So you need a cylinder with the relatively thick walls. And of course, 
See? Where is it? Well, it's here. There is a tiny piece of paper. Nothing is happening to it. Nothing. Did you see it? What did happen? It flashed. Well, it's a also it's a physics, but also a test of your reaction time. Let's say one more. Let's see one more time. So I push it in. Nothing happening because it's too slow. It's not an adiabatic process. But if I yank it very quickly, in that case, <coughs> there is no exchange between the gas, the air inside and outside. And in this case, the work done by me, by my hand, getting completely transferred into the internal energy of air, temperature rises very quickly. Oops. Again. And that's how a diesel works. It doesn't need an ignition. Uh, when <coughs> piston compresses the fuel quickly, the temperature rises very quickly above uh, uh, the uh, well, critical temperature and it ignites. Now, of course, there's another exp uh, experiment. What's going to happen if we release the gas very quickly? So you've seen this CO2 cartridge. We use it. We used it for what demonstration did we use it? Anyone? Exactly. The law of conservation of linear momentum. So it's like a rocket. But also, <coughs> well, actually, I don't need it. So, touch it. You can pass it around, but just don't, don't hold too, too long. So when the gas expands very quickly, it does work. The gas does positive work. So the temperature of the gas decreases very, uh, very quickly. And how do we use it? This is how we use it in practice. This is just a big CO2 cartridge. Beware. Oops, safety first. <coughs> Did you see the snow? That's how it's made. Yeah, it has a huge CO2 cartridge. <coughs> so tiny, tiny flakes, snowflakes, why? Uh, they have developed because when it expands, the temperature in this region drops very quickly below freezing temperature of water. So there's always water in air. And uh, those water droplets get frozen. So they make <coughs> snowflakes. And uh, the graph of the adiabatic process looks very similar to the isothermal. So again, it's a curve, but slightly different. We need to know about this process only its definition. There is one problem ahead which is supposed to be solved with this knowledge. Well, first of all, <coughs> uh, this situation is very similar to one of your homework problems. I want to quickly discuss it, not solve completely. But here, first, that's what we read, thermal equilibrium. It is happening to gases, but it is reaching thermal equilibrium. So this happens with no heat exchange with the surrounding. And that means we can apply this equation, heat balance equation. First uh, statement. Second statement. Because it's happening to gases, to helium, we also can apply all our previous knowledge about the ideal gas law and whatever we want to. So, what is happening? Well, PV equals.
equals n r t. So this is the knowledge we can definitely can use. So <coughs> what's happening? This is the initial situation. P1, V1, T1, P2, V2, T2, actually N1, N2. They have also different amount of gas inside. That's V1, P1, T1. What's wrong with temperature number one? The unit, it has to be converted in Celsius. If we want to use the ideal gas law, we have to convert the temperature uh, in Kelvin, from Celsius in Kelvin. Now, that's V2, P2, T2. The initial temperature of the gas in the second container. And again, same thing, it's given in Celsius. If we want to use the ideal gas law, we have to convert it into Kelvin. Now we connect them. After they get connected, that's what we have eventually. Of course, time passes. We wait. But this is what we have now. One new container. What is the volume of this new container? Of course, total volume. Why? Because normally, of course, we neglect the volume provided by the hose. It's too small uh, com comparing the volume of each tank. Where else? Well, the new amount of gas, of course, is just the total amount of two gases combined. What about pressure? What about temperature? Well, if we use an ideal gas law, we can write it Three times, P1, V1 equals N1, RT1. P2, V2 equals N2, RT2. And P final times final volume, which is the sum of this, has to be equal to the total amount of gas now, times T final. Let's call it final. 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 Unfortunately, the last equation has two unknowns. We don't know the final pressure, we don't know the final temperature. And here, when we start using the heat balance equation, it still has to work. <coughs> uh, still, well, there is no phase transition here. So there's amount of heat, which is which, which is which. So this one, the first container absorbs because it starts from a lower temperature. And the second one releases. But because there is no heat exchange with the surroundings, that's what we can write. Now, hence, mass. Do I want to use mass? Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's actually easier to use the original expression for, well, it doesn't, we, we could have used molar, molar uh, uh, constant, but we would never use it before. So let's say we want to use our original equation for the heat absorbed or released. In this situation, first of all, the first notice is this cancelled. When everything is equal to e E0, uh, this actual value doesn't matter. <coughs> now, uh, each mass, of course, 
is proportional to the number of moles times the molar mass. So we can rewrite the number of moles times the molar mass times. This has to be equal to final temperature minus the initial temperature number one plus. That's the same gas, so the same molar mass. Actually, it turns out it doesn't matter if it's a helium or something else because it's also canceled, right? Final temperature minus initial temperature equals zero. And again, we can cross out this constant, the molar mass. So, <clears throat> what do we do next? Well, the strategy now is clear. The work, the algebra, requires some time, but the strategy is clear. This is the amount of gas, number one. We can use it in here. This is the amount of gas, number two. We can use it in here. And last equation has only one unknown in it. So we can solve the last equation for this unknown, and then we can use it to calculate the final pressure. All right, moving on. One more problem. <clears throat> so I just want to talk about this particular term because it's outdated and what it means. Well, PV diagram. First, the volume in is constant. So the volume is constant. V1. And we're adding some heat, so the pressure should go up, temperature should go up. And the final pressure, well, that's P1, P2, reaches to 100 kilopascals. And here, for this process, one, two, we have added this many joules. And then you perform this weird compression. Well, first of all, compression, what does it mean? That means the, well, that's V1, that's V2. That's all I don't need today. V1. V2 equals V1, P2 equals 200 kilopascals. And now we're compressing it. So that V3 has to be less. Now, how? And first, we read this isobaric. It means the compression is having that constant pressure. P3 is supposed to be equal to P2. And for this process, Q2, 3, there is no heat exchange. That's what the next word means. That's why we have to talk about this process so we would know what this word means. So, <coughs> ah, Q1, 2. Now, <coughs> everybody knows what to do. For each process, we can write uh, uh, first law of thermodynamics. For each state, we can write an ideal gas law, and that will give you the answer immediately, almost immediately. Now, <coughs> I want to talk about entropy. You know what is entropy from chemistry? And uh, Here, you can see layers. Those are actually just candy balls. You can do the same. This is what we call a ordered state, highly ordered state. And when we change the state, that's what we call the process. So this is one possible process. And I can reverse it. I can use exactly the same states backwards to bring it back to its initial state. That's what we call a reversible process. There's another process I can make.
I made 10 turns relative to you counterclockwise. And that's what I see now. Do you think if I make now 10 turns clockwise, I will reach initial state? Is it ordered? Of course not. So that's what we call irreversible process. And the difference is huge. Because from mechanics, everything we've learned in mechanics is reversible. But what we know in thermodynamics is that a lot of processes are irreversible. For example, if you take a cup with hot water and place it on a bench, it cools down. And no matter how long you wait afterwards, it's not going to come back again to be warm. So a lot of processes in thermodynamics are irreversible, like this one, like gas expansion. So to describe this phenomenon, we have to introduce a new law and a new physical quantity. The new quantity is entropy. And entropy tells us the level of order, highly ordered state, low entropy, disordered chaotic state, high entropy. And then under regular circumstances, if we let system do whatever it wants to do, entropy always rises. Well, for a reversible, re reverse, reversible uh, process, as you've seen, entropy was unchanged. Change in the entropy was equal to zero. But for the irreversible process, entropy goes up and never goes down. Of course, we can bring it back to original state, but not doing just the uh, process backwards. No. We have to open it. We have to take him out. We have to, put, we have to use an additional path to bring this system to the original, to the original states. <coughs> this is what I want to ask you. That's my actual question about you being here. What do you think? To answer this question, the best strategy is to eliminate, to eliminate wrong answers. For example, if you remember I said two minutes ago, in mechanics, all processes are reversible. So, the Newton's second law, the law of conservation of energy, cannot explain the existence of irreversible processes. Cannot. So, conservation of energy. Linear momentum. And of course, all of the above also wouldn't work because they contradict each other. So what's left? The second law of thermodynamics. It's an additional law. Yes, you see? We all think alike. It's an additional law. It's been on the previous slide, yeah? Here, the second law of thermodynamics. We have to use it in addition to all other laws to explain the existence of irreversible processes, to explain that heat always flows from a hot object to the cold and never backwards. <coughs> and uh, also we know <coughs> that When objects change temperature, they change some properties. For example, uh, here. If we take a ruler and we heat it up, it expands. It's getting longer. For each element, there is a number which tells, which we can use to, my, to figure out how much longer it becomes. The coefficient of linear expansion. So the elongation is proportional to the temperature change. Now, what's going to happen if we take two objects like this one, brass and uh, uh, aluminum together, and I heat them up? Uh, 
Alright. Where does it bend? They have different coefficients of linear expansion. So <coughs> the one which uh, has a higher coefficient bends longer. Where do we use it? Thermostats. In every thermostat there is a bimetallic strip, like, well, not L, but in many. And it bends, and when it bends, uh, well, reaching certain curvature, it clicks uh, the trigger. And the temp uh, your heating system starts or stops working. Next question. What do you think will happen to the holes? I have a ring, and if I heat it up, I only have two options. It contracts, it shrinks, or it's even wider. So, <coughs> choose your answer, remember it. First of all, how do I check? Well, I have a ball which actually doesn't fit. So this ring is not large enough. All I need to do is just I just give you time to keep answering the question. All right, let's see if it's good enough. So what did happen? It expands. So normally all objects in space expands when they get heated up. Normally. For example, how do we measure temperature? If you have a simple thermometer, yeah, a ball and a graduated cylinder, and you heat it up, it changes its volume. So that's how the temperature originally has been measured. So that's what's happening to holes. And uh, this is what is happening to the th liquid in that th th thermometer. It expands, the, the volume increases, proportional to temperature change, and uh, we just read the number. And the coefficient of volumetric expansion is related to the coefficient of linear expansion, just three times the linear one. So, ah, what did you say? Let's see, what did you say? What was number three? Expands, okay. So what about this situation? So, the opposition to heating up is cooling down. When we cool things down, they contract, usually. So what I have here, Actually, here, I'll show you. I'm running out of time. Come on, every time it wants to tell us that, yeah, I'm Sony. Here. Come back. All right. Okay, that's what I have here. This is not a just a regular glass bottle. This is actually an iron flask filled up with water. And I want to cool it down. That's for me, but it's too soon. 
because this is my last experiment, which I want to do for you and with you. Well, kind of, you can see it. Yeah. So many things. Life is much harder than physics. Okay. See? When I want to cool it down. Keep working. How do I cool it down? Of course, I have liquid nitrogen for that. It's now very cheap. The problem is sometimes liquid nitrogen is not enough. It evaporates very quickly. It's a boiling temperature is 77 Kelvin. Now let's wait. If anything happens, it's going to be Now, you know what it is? Last chance to get it back. <laughs> Last chance. And there is one more uh, work for you to do today. Can you guess which one? Evaluations, exactly. That's a requirement. I know I'm not perfect because who is? But today is your chance to put all your grievances on the paper. And I need uh, someone to help me. So you know how it should work. Someone should distribute these evaluations and collect and then bring them back on the second floor. So who? would like to volunteer for this. Thank you. So as soon as I leave, you know that uh, faculty cannot be present during your evaluation. Just a sec, don't leave. I want to see your responses. Oh, you just came. Perfect timing. So what do you expect? None of the above. And by none of the above, what do you expect? Come back next year. Well, <coughs> maybe nothing. Do we have some more? All right. Whatever happens, happens. I'm leaving. I'll be back in 20 minutes. You will tell me. I'll see you t uh, later. So, it's perfect, it's absolutely, please raise your hand if you haven't done it before, never in your life. All right, so everybody knows what to do. Thank you. I'll see you soon.
It blew up, and water came out through the crack. So there's a hole right here. And it's very cold. <laughs> so you can look at it. Now it's not dangerous. Here's a pieces of this flask. So what is happening to water?
Thank you. 